Good afternoon, intuitives. Gonna try to get a couple videos up because I'm off on a Saturday and that never happens, except when I have to work a holiday Monday. Such is life on a golf course. Um, finally got my phone replaced and got all that taken care of, so I'll be able to answer comments, you know, more quickly as I'll have a phone that doesn't work when it feels like it. Uh, welcome new subscribers. This video is actually for ENFJs, which I occasionally do. Now, for those of you that stumble upon this who haven't seen my channel before, I am not an ENFJ. I am a Sigma INFJ heterosexual demisexual male witch. Sums it up pretty good. An ex firefighter. Progressive. Eh, well, well that, that, that's enough. But, so, you know, INFJs, where are the most similar to ENFJs, same functions, different orders, and we often understand each other the best of anyone, you know, that isn't also the same type as us. And a lot of the crucial people throughout my life have been ENFJs, uh, people who understood me, especially like in my younger days when I struggled to understand myself. So part of this video uh, is me reflecting on some of the trials and tribulations some ENFJs that I was close with in the past had to endure, particularly between the ages of like 18 and 24. And for this video, you know, it, I did a video on this for INFJs, and some of what I said in the INFJ video relates to ENFJs too, in the sense, and it's all the title, but I guess I should mention it by now, that this video is about why do some ENFJs give up on love? And like I said, for some of the same reasons as INFJs, but there's some extra challenges for ENFJs um, in that regard. So we're going to get into why that happens, and you know, to a degree, it's the sad state of our world because if the, the world's sweetest people can't find unconditional love, then what hope is there for an introvert like me? So why do ENFJs give up on love? Well. Like INFJs, uh, most ENFJs tend to be demisexual, and we are in that truly, madly, deeply category. Um, we search for unconditional love and pretty much have our, our whole lives. Like the idea of a friends with benefits or a casual fling doesn't really appeal to the vast majority of ENFJs, you know, or INFJs for that matter. So... In today's culture, there's a struggle right off the bat, uh, particularly for younger ENFJ females, because the in your like, let's just say college years, you know, most people aren't looking for something serious, particularly men. So that narrows the field down pretty much, and you know, you have these sort of like player f boy types out there that, as sick as it is. The fact that, say, a university ENFJ girl is looking for, like, a real relationship and isn't into the whole, like, hooking up culture. Some, like, player type might take that as a challenge and, you know, essentially try to convince her that he's looking for something more than a fling when in reality he wants a fling and is turned on by the idea that it's a challenge and it's all a game to him. Uh, also, another reason, a big reason why ENFJs can give up on love is, and I did a video about this, you should check it out if you're watching this video, about why narcissists target ENFJs. You know, ENFJs, in my opinion, are the sweetest people. Uh, they want to see the best in everybody. They can bring out the best in most people, certainly in INFJs. But when I'm around ENFJs, I am a true ambervert in, you know, during that time. They, ENFJs tend to know, you know, the point I'm trying to get across and what I'm trying to say. And, you know, while their intuition's not as strong as ours, it's strong enough that they can read me pretty well, even when I'm being, like, all shy and monotoned. So, but to my point about this is narcissists, ENFJs are a big target for narcissists. And I'm not going to go through all the points. Watch the other video. It, it, hopefully it helps you avoid some things that you look back and want to avoid. And one of the biggest reasons why 
narcissists target ENFJs is because of the ENFJs Achilles heel, particularly younger ENFJs, and that is you struggle real hard to say no because you're such people pleasers. So sadly, you know, ENFJs, particularly younger ENFJs, can be talked into doing things that they don't want to do or aren't comfortable with simply because they struggle so much to say no. They, Unlike, you know, INFJs, they, you back us into a corner and make us feel like we can't say no, we're going to rage out. We're, you're, you're, it, the INFJ rage is going to come. I did a video on that, too, if you're curious about it. But ENFJs, like I said, particularly younger ones, the older they get, you eventually learn. But younger ENFJs will essentially cry and hope that that makes the person trying to exploit them guilty. But in the case of some, and particularly narcissists, again, this is disgusting, that turns them on. The idea that you're not saying no, but you don't want to do it, and you're going to do it anyway, because narcissists seek subservience and submissiveness. So that can lead to some terrible experiences for the young ENFJ. And from what I viewed through my ENFJ friends, you know, that's like a un university slash few years out thing. You know, then you'll find as you get a lot, of, some ENFJs as they get older, and like a little side note, a lot of ENFJs I know too also got married at like 25. They dated the same person pretty much all through university and then married a year or two later. That's one path. We're talking about the other path. So, you know, um, I'd say by like mid-20s, some ENFJs get frustrated with love for another reason. Everybody's preoccupied with work and, you know, climb the ladder, climb the ladder, especially, you know, us younger generations because the baby boomers gave us an uphill battle and there were no ladders to climb and they actually, you know, tried to retroactively say that ladders never existed and, you know, destroyed all evidence of ladders and just said they were just the best jumpers ever. Ladders, you know, they'll, they'll try to be like, ladders, that's like something out of Atlantis. It's never real. It's a myth. <laughs> just not as good as us. Nobody can ever be. We are the pinnacle. So, you know, in the work environment, particularly in, in your mid-20s, everybody's busy with work. And ENFJs, for the most part, want the real thing. They want, you know, that true, deep, unconditional love connection, the same as INFJs do. But a lot of times, um, you may end up in what I call a relationship of convenience, to where you think somebody's really into you, but you're just, like, their best easy option in the sense that if you work together, you're in the same circles, you know, Think about that in, and I was in a relationship like that once in my late 20s. Yeah, late 20s. So, in that scenario, you have to remind yourself, would you be dating this person if you didn't work with them? Or are you only dating them because you're, quote, ready to date again? And you're just around this person all the time, and given your busy work schedule, you don't really have time to, quote, meet other people, particularly if you're in a job that requires you to travel a lot. So that can happen. And, you know, ENFJs will feel played like that they were just used as the best option available to the person they were dating, but that person never really sought to, like, truly get to know that person, you know, never um, ma really made an effort to keep the relationship going after, say, somebody changed jobs and you weren't by default always together, you know. Like the kind of person that wouldn't make any sacrifices to keep the relationship going. It was all about convenience. You know, you were, they found you attractive and you were always around. And they're like, that'll be fun for six months. That can lead the ENFJ to get more jaded. Because ENFJs are very authentic people, as INFJs are. And ENFJs do not like to be used. Especially by this point of life, an ENFJ will know that in certain circumstances, they are seen as an easy target for people to take advantage of, and an ENFJ will, you know, could become more introverted at this time. You are the most introverted of the extroverts, after all. <laughs> We're the most extroverted of the introverts as INFJs. Kind of weird, isn't it? So, ENFJs can throw themselves into their work at this time, may start to think that unconditional love may never happen, or that they miss their chance, that that 
person that perhaps they dated the majority of the time at university was their only chance. You know, hopefully later you'll realize, as most of us of the um, introverted feelers realize, is that person was probably the right person for you at that stage of life, but university is not the real world, and that's why a lot of those relationships struggle once the two of you get out into the real world and have real jobs and are in that like student world. So, but things become a little better at this point because by your late 20s, um, you know what you're looking for. You know, whoever you are, whatever you're looking for, you know what you're looking for in a person and you refuse to settle for less. You're not going to be anybody's fling and, you know, you're not going to be somebody's friends with benefits or relationship of convenience. You want the real thing and nothing else. I, I'm right there with you, ENFJs. Uh, what can be frustrating at this time, though, and why, you know, it's hard for ENFJs to find relationships is, is that most likely, because ENFJs are not like most people, as are INFJs, you realize that what you're looking for is rare as shit. And by the time you're approaching 30, that dating pool is even smaller because, you know, people have married and stuff. It's, you know, anybody's dating pool at 30 is not going to be what it was at 23. You know, like I said, people marry, other people move away, people have kids, people, there's all kinds of different things that can go on. So, you know, around this time, ENFJs can may think, well, it's never going to happen for me. Um, really, like, not even try, you know, completely throw yourself into your work. That's what INFJs do, too. You know, get a dog and just sort of, you know, more or less come to the conclusion that you're going to be, you know, by default, living a life of celibacy as we're not fans of casual sex or friends with benefits and throw yourself into your other interests in life. And the more you do that, the less you get out and the less potential you have to find that person that you're looking for, you know, albeit it's, it's not easy. I know. But trust me. I know. But they, and nevertheless, they, those people, those blue roses, as I say, do, albeit rarely, exist and, you know, the whole timing and right place, right time. INFJs are the worst at timing, so you, at least you got a better shot factoring that into the equation. But another point to mention, and I mentioned this in my INFJ video, but, you know, I'm making this video for ENFJs, so you probably don't watch my INFJ videos, although I do make some videos occasionally that relate to both, and you should watch them. They're on my ENFJ playlist. So, in today's world, online dating is king. No go for ENFJs or INFJs. You know, ENFJs love falling in love. They, they love finding that the real thing, making that connection, truly finding someone who just wants to know everything about them and could just stay up all night talking to you on the couch, you know, snuggled up without any expectation of anything sexual. Just They are just that into getting to know you and that person that, you know, would constantly do uh, little niceties without being asked that, you know, to show affection. I found ENFJs love that, which is good for me because that's how INFJs show affection. We do, you know, little things that we notice that most people don't. We just do them without being asked and, you know, makes us seem like we're the greatest thing ever. It's like, all I did was remember something you said and do and did it. It's like, Okay, it's pretty cool that there are people out there that like that, as opposed to, you know, ooh, shiny platinum, you know, materialist, as neither one of us, INFJs and ENFJs are, but sidebars over. So online dating, it's typically people looking for something casual, looking, you know, for one night stands and stuff. That's, that's not us. And also because, you know, a lot of us are demisexual and we require that deep connection, really hard to do that on a dating app and I don't care which one it is because they're all the same and you know even my my uh my blue blood ex-olympian prominent friend she's on the rich people one Raya she says it's all the same the difference between Raya and Tinder is is that the f boys are posing next to nicer cars or on boats and you know wearing Rolexes and designer clothes but beyond that she said it's all the same and she showed me a bunch of profiles and yeah she's right so that's why it can become difficult for us, you know, we are in a, you know, we are intuitive feelers in a world made for sensors. We are those 
seeking, you know, true unconditional love, seeking our, our soulmate, our twin flame, when most people are just looking to get laid. Just know, ENFJs, that there are what you're looking for. You know, we are out there. We're hard to find. And particularly, give you a little INFJ advice, if, the, if you think you found a person that's, you know, the type you want, but they're struggling to make the first move, it's probably because they're an introvert and they're going to overthink the shit out of it, especially INFJs. If you're in the INFJs, you know, if you find one and it looks like we're into you, it means we are and we're just afraid to make the first move, which please do that for us because, well, you know, we'll overthink it and chances are, you know, it might be a while before you find another one of us. But it is truly a shame, in my opinion, that one of the types that struggle the most to find unconditional love is, in my opinion, the type that truly appreciates and experiences unconditional love more than anybody else. It's another fallacy I forgot to mention is, is another thing that can get ENFJs to give up on love is, particularly when you're younger, you always feel like you're the one, you know, making the relationship work. You're, you're doing all the work in the relationship. You're carrying all the emotional baggage and your partner's just along for the ride, that you're so emotionally invested in the relationship and they're just, you know, having fun. I think that's a bad experience that every ENFJ has gone through where the ENFJ is in a committed relationship, but the person the ENFJ is with is just casually dating you. So ENFJs, you know, don't worry about fitting in. I know a lot of ENFJs tend to try casual dating in like their early mid-twenties to try to fit in and quickly realize it's not for them. Take it from an INFJ, don't bother, it won't end well. Just, you know, don't give up. Know that, you know, the rare blue roses you're looking for are elusive yet real. And, you know, you know what how rare unconditional love is. If you think you found it, go for it. Don't worry about your social, economic classes, whatever jobs you have whether somebody has to move, some of the most successful relationships I know of and some of these people were ENFJs, required one person to move to be with the other one. That's also proof that it's not a relationship of convenience, too. And if you find types like this ENFJs, no, you will not have to carry all the emotional baggage of the relationship. You will find someone who is invested in it as much as you, and I know you're the people pleasers and always try to one-up things of that kind, you'll, you'll, the, what you're looking for exists, you know, trust your intuition, you know it when you see it, also trust your int intuition, you know, F-boy gonna F-boy, and just don't give them the time of day.